You want answers? You can't handle the truth! What does time travel, Mars, and the White House have to do with each other? Well, Andrew Bashago is a prominent figure in the truth movement. For more than 10 years, he has shared with the American people the true facts of our great nation's accomplishments in time travel and Mars visitation. He has done so as somebody who served bravely in two secret U.S. defense projects in which time travel on Earth and voyages to Mars were first undertaken. As a result of his courageous um, advocacy as a crusading lawyer, Andy's credited with ending the time travel and Mars cover-ups by the U.S. government on behalf of the American people. He is now running for president of the United States, as a matter of fact. That was a brilliant introduction, Chris, because it's all true. You're asking us to believe that you went to Mars essentially in in 1981, beginning in 1981, in in a device in New York City and near Los Angeles, devices in which a conventional elevator had a dual use and morphed into a jump room that when you got there 20 minutes later, millions of miles, it opened up and you were in the sub-basement of a U.S. facility on the Red Planet. And now, in addition to that, you're asking us to believe that the president did so, that he was one of your same-aged peers who was part of that that element, that that program in the secret space program. So the problem is that we were compelled to reveal the truth because, look, if we concealed the fact that Obama was involved and he later was connected to the project, we would have been accused of spinning the truth. People would have said, well – you know, you worked for the CIA when you were in the jump room program. You weren't paid. You weren't benefited. But that's who was running it. That's who was administering the program. You were all selected for different reasons. We were in a bit of an epistemological dilemma as whistleblowers. If we revealed the truth that Obama was one of our contemporaries in the program, I mean, he's only 45 days older than me. And in fact, William Cameron McCool, the, the later space shuttle astronaut who was also one of the Mars jumpers, was five days younger than me. So Barack and Willie and I were kind of in the the median age group of that group. The average age, in fact, was 17 when we started training. If we told the truth, we protected the validity of the story as it really happened, but we made ourselves uh, vulnerable to the charge that, look, this is beyond belief now because now you're linking the sitting president. But the problem is that that's the truth of what happened. We were in the Mars Jump Room program with a young Barack Obama using the name Barry Satoro. And you know something else about the story? He's the president. (laughs) The individual that he asked to plant that story denying his involvement, Tommy Vidor, was at that time the spokesman for the National Security Council. That implies that the NSC, consisting of the president, the vice president, Mr. Biden, the secretary of state, uh, secretary of defense, and then the national security advisor and assistant National Security Advisor, vetted the question of whether or not and how they should respond to our true information that Barack Obama is essentially a former astronaut of this country, that he was a direct participant in the secret space program. So we went forward with the truth. It provided ample opportunity for ridicule. I was ridiculed on the the, the Stephen Colbert report. It's been kicked around the internet. MSNBC picked it up and declared that William Stillings and I were former government employees, even though we were never paid, never benefited under the GI Bill of Rights, while being having our records kept by the Navy, by the way. In any case, that's the situation we were in. If we, if we told the truth, we did the right thing. We preserved the truth of the story. But if we lied to avoid that giggle factor, we would not have told the truth. And so that's that was basically what happened there with the with the Obama Mars story. It's a true story. I had mentioned it on Coast to Coast AM on the 11 10 11 show and that that triggered the um the article coming out in wired.com where the National Security Council basically denied what could have readily readily been dismissed as an urban legend. How do you think the mainstream media would react to something like Project Pegasus? We've seen the fact that the mainstream media is not competent to report the truth. Look at the fact that when the Obama-Mars story broke, they had three individuals, 
myself, William Stillings, and Bernard Mendez, who lived in different states at the time, Washington, California, New York. They were different types of guys. One was a lawyer admitted to the federal bar. That's me at the United States District Court for the Western District of Washington, practicing at the state and federal level. Then there was basically Brett is a tech geek, right? He's a brilliant technologist. And then Bernard was a career intelligence officer. And the mainstream media had the opportunity to interview us to determine whether or not Barack Obama was a former astronaut, and none of them called. So how can I censor myself from revealing the fact that time travel was achieved by our government if the mainstream media is not even reporting the true past of the president of the United States? Well said. In 1971-72, I was provided martial arts training. It was basically a mix of Aikido and Karate mostly defensive in nature, to protect myself physically when I was time traveling. That martial arts instruction was developed in a recent face-to-face meeting between William Whitecrow and I in, in Northern California, where he lives, actually at his residence, was validated. In other words, we established that he was my martial arts instructor, because William had been my instructor in Project Pegasus, but it gets, it gets more interesting. I then encountered yeah. William again, on Mars. He was one of the army guards who was protecting us on Mars. When I was visiting at his, him, what, about a half year ago at his home in Northern yeah. Cal, we recalled that there was, we were standing next to a, a kind of a Quonset hut on Mars, and he was describing how another team had been interdicted by these pterodactyl like predators, and there was a real threat to some of our people's survival on the surface. And so we wandered over to their location in the company of William Stillings, but we had only two AR-15s, which are basically the burp guns that we were going to need to knock these pterodactyl-like predators out of the sky if they attacked us, and they did. William and I are not just Facebook friends. <laughs> we're, former no. co- we're former colleagues who stood back-to-back and protected ourselves and, and Brett while about 20 pterodactyl-like predators were actually dive-bombing us, and William threw me in a, the, the AR-15. William and, and, and I saved each other's lives and Brett's life uh, many years ago, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, by st- basically 1982-83 time frame, yeah. by standing back-to-back, knocking pterodactyls out of the sky as they were dive-bombing us on Mars, and we're not making it up. So I'm now bringing William White Crow forward as a fifth Mars whistleblower, a fifth Mars jump room whistleblower. Wow. Wow. When I encountered him on Mars, I didn't recognize him as Bill, my martial arts instructor from Pegasus, and I was only able to put those two things together in 2015, and now we're bringing it forward publicly after I asked William to come forward to, among other things, help my presidential campaign because somebody of William's dedicated and distinguished service on behalf of the United States Army goes a long way to establish that I'm telling the truth about the development of time travel and Project Pegasus and then the covert history of Mars exploration that was undertaken by a very young and brave generation of Americans 30, 35 years ago. And William was one of the people who I'm very grateful for because he was keeping us alive on the surface. That is absolutely amazing. William, um, this is, you know, the first time we're discussing any of this. And I think the first time that you've discussed any of this in public, what was the recruitment like? Uh, very simple. With some people, you know, a lot of people will look at payment. But once you understand the long term implications and what's really going on, you do it because it needs to be done. I know that sounds crazy and may sound military minded uh, to a point, but that's where you're at at the time when you're dealing with things at this level. And, and that, you know, that's how come I always told you guys and other people there's more to the to the story about what's really going on on Earth and and everything else. The recruitment was it was they wanted the good people, but they wanted the people that would think on think, not just follow crazy orders. Okay, this is your team. This is what you go do, and this is how you do it. And once somebody's put under your care, uh, nothing's going to touch them. You know, there's many different, everything is compartmentalized. You know, Andrew is an individual and Obama, and and there's a lot of people of history that have gone to, how do you think people get to where they are? You know, everybody thinks and turns around and goes, okay, well, everybody's put there. Now you understand a bigger picture. Andrew, myself, and and actually many other people, and hopefully more more will come forward as time goes on, uh, have dealt with experiences that most people even in their lives don't know about. When Andrew came here the first time, 
and talked to me on my compound here. And then I told my wife right after he left, uh, mentioned the name Karen and, you know, things of this nature. And she got tears in her eyes and started to cry. Let that be an example of what he's talking about, the truth of it. What's going to make a person do that? My wife knew about it. That was it. But she understand the implications of what this meant, you know, because I haven't talked in many, 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 many years or to anybody about this kind of stuff. But this is what's really going on out there. That's why when you mentioned earlier in the show when I was on before this one, I said, if you, you people out there want to know the truth, uh, the question is, can you handle it? And so what what were your ages at the time? Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of things that most of these people you have to understand are picked as, as children. You know, and that's what really got me with Andrew the first time I listened to him. And I, I just, I knew there was a familiar, there's something about his voice and everything and what, what he talked about before we even met, you know, this time. It wasn't just a familiarity, it was what he was saying, you know, and knew is true. You know those things you see you talk about knowing without knowing? This is one of them things. And why do you know that? Because you have covered memories of things that are going on. And once things start happening, the reality starts coming to the surface. And uh, all of a sudden, the synchronicities start happening, and you start meeting one another, and things go on. There were other projects involved besides him and everything. You know, to be part of a program where you were guarding uh, presidents, future presidents, and things like this, uh, can you say no? Chris, I think that uh, just to estimate, because I was a child, I was 10. I turned 10 in, on September 18th of 71, and mm -hmm. that's when William was my martial arts instructor that year, that fifth grade year. And then I encountered him yeah. 10 or 11 years later. So he was initially around 18. I think I think William has yeah. eight years on me, seven or eight years. So he was either a recently discharged Vietnam-era uh, mm -hmm. Army soldier, and, and then he was teaching young people in these special access programs how to defend themselves. Yes. Another thing that we want to think about here, too, is when you're put in these programs, you're usually when you leave the military or – uh, they will turn around and grab you within a military, degrade you, and put you in, a, in, a, in another program. That's the way that the military works. Nothing is as it seems. It never is. If they discover one project name, they'll just change the name, compartmentalize it, move, compartmentalize it, and move it somewhere else. So a lot of the ops people that were in these programs were military individuals that just came back from combat situations, like Andrew just said, or they were, shall we say, um, Augmented is the best word. That's what we like to use in the operations field. Augmented to other things. Sometimes you had to take a reduction in rank and pay and everything. So all of a sudden, you seem like you were a nobody. And they just augment you to another program. And I, they do that with a lot of people out there. Absolutely. Chris, can you see the adamance by which I addressed Obama's deception? I mean, we were not just yeah. on Mars. But in this instance that we're describing, William and I protected the three of us from a direct attack by basically yeah. about 20 flying dinosaur era like creatures. So once you've done that, I like to say that you know even sitting in a traffic jam on the San Diego freeway is cake, right? Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. you're you're not in these intense situations that we were actually in. So after that, it doesn't it, it it's nothing to tell the truth and implicate the sitting president as one of our fellows because he was just somebody else in the program. He was he was yes. he, we, we we weren't big shots just because they knew we were future presidents. But That's after correct. those kinds of intense experiences with highly trained military people like William, I'm talking about true honorable warriors who protected human life when we were there. And I'm, I'm grateful for life for William personally. We are brothers for life, just as Brett and Bernie and I and William are. We were in some very intense experiences together. It wasn't the kind of combat that William and his generation saw in Vietnam, but man, it was intense sometime. So I'm not going to lie about that just because one of our fellow participants was president. So what? Yeah. When you've had that kind of experience, it's like everything else is cake. It's all cake. I like to say after Mars, everything is cake. 